Hey guys, Mary Margaret Humes joins the show today and we got the chance to talk about Dawson's Creek, of course. We talked about some of her favorite episodes, her favorite memories. We did some fan questions and even talked about the possibility of a reunion out there and a reunion episode. Guys, this is the show and it starts right now. Welcome to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a sh- welcome to the show. We have with us, you know her as Mama Leary, but we have Miss Mary Margaret Humes. How are you today, ma'am? I'm very wonderful. Having a good morning so far. How are you, Josh? I'm doing good. Uh, this was um, as we're talking just before we came on this interview. I was really looking forward to. It. I was excited that we got to be able to um, to be able to get together with. Uh, let's talk Dawson's Creek. I mean, obviously that's. Um, that's what the focus of this series has kind of been. And um, you were a huge part in that show of being um, Miss Gail Leary. How was that character? And really, how did that even come to be of getting onto the show to start with? Oh, well, let me see. I can go back to my very first audition <laughs> <laughs> for Gail Leary. I remember I wore, um, because I had read the pilot episode and there was a little description about, you know, the big hair and she was a newscaster and, kind of spunky and kind of sexy. We didn't know which, you know, (laughs) which way we're going to go with that sexiness, like when she had the affair. But I remember walking into the audition and it was Kevin Williamson and Paul Steuben and a few other writers. And I walked in, I went to sit down in the chair. I put my purse on the back of the chair and it kind of tumbled, which made me stumble. And then I just sat my butt right down in the chair like nothing had happened. And I thought, well, that was kind of cool, calm and collective. You know, we like that. The news anchor has to be spontaneous. And uh, that was what my character was doing, you know, that first season she was on the news. So I don't know if that got me the job or my reading (laughs) or (laughs) my my, um, laughing at myself. I don't know, but it it was a great gig to get. Uh, So how was it kind of once you got into the script and realized that 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 was the storyline they were going to go with? Like, did that, you know, how was that kind of coming into it? Um, it was really like a gift, I felt, because playing, you know, the darker emotions and, um, seemingly, you know, Gail's life was wonderful. She had the perfect husband, the perfect child, the perfect, you know, job, lifestyle. And she really had gotten to a place in her, her life where I guess, you know, midlife crisis, where you feel like, is is this all there is? I need something else. I, I, I need to move forward forward with something and get something you know another desire fulfilled um so when they told me that i was going to be having an affair i'm like oh my god how how do you cheat on someone as wonderful as john wesley ship um but then i thought this is really going to give me stuff to play with with john and he and i liked each other so well and worked so well off of each other that when we had that fight, when I had that confession and we had that fight, ooh, wow, I just got goosebumps. <laughs> wow, that was crazy. Ooh, 20 years later, I got goosebumps. It was just, it was raw. It was real. I don't know if we stayed on script, but John Wesley and I just connected and the hurt, the pain, the anguish, all of that was so real it came from the gut it wasn't even acting it was just two people going through something that was just horrific so i was so pleased that the writers gave you know gave me that avenue to go down with john wesley that that was actually one of the fan questions was how hard was it to film that scene where mitch was flipping out yelling you know breaking things you know over that confession like that that was from sarah sarah luter asked that question on one of the facebook groups but you know, how was that scene to be able to kind of to film with he had to have that emotional? It was scary. It was really scary because, you know, it took place during the hurricane. So all the lights went out. So you have that element of darkness to begin with. And he was like in denial, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deal with this. I'm not going to deal with this. Where's that friggin' flashlight? And then when she, he whipped it up and put it right in my face. Again, I'm getting goosebumps. It was just so unexpected. I mean, it's like we didn't even rehearse it. They shot the rehearsal because they knew that the two of us were going to be able to deliver. Um, 
so those tears you see, those, those aren't manufactured tears. Those come from the gut all the way up and through, you know, the eyeballs. And the intensity on John's face just scared the dickens out of me. It's like, I, I've lost him. He'll never come back. He'll never come back. But then a little bit later on in that um, same episode, we have the scene in the car where he says, you know, he's always loved me, but now he chooses to hate me. <laughs> Gut wrenching. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was, let me see, season one, episode four, The Hurricane. That was like one of my all time favorites. I think for John too, probably. One of the things like talking with Kieran and talking with Nina on um, just earlier this week about, you know, so much of the writing and so much of the, the different characters. One thing it seems like that um, Dawson's Creek really did was kind of break that stereotype, break the norm, um, mm -hmm. kind of put things out there. It wasn't a normal thing um, to kind of showcase a, an affair being on the female side, um, you know, you know, coming from the mom. How do you feel that kind of, was that kind of any kind of play into kind of that whole part of it and just kind of knowing that that is a very different spin to a storyline that's kind of out there normally? Right, because I think typically, I think probably typically people think about, you know, a male character having an affair. So um, for Kevin to have had the foresight to say, no, let's switch things up. Because Mitchell, you know, he was the one who was kind of bumbling, Mitchell, my son, um, John Wesley Ship. he was the one that was kind of bumbling around. He didn't really have a career. I think at the time he was designing a restaurant that had an aquatic theme or something. I think that's what was on the table during the fight. So he was the one that was kind of lost. And I was the one who was the success story. So you would think that I would have everything that I need, that he might be the one, you know, when mom's off to work, he might be, you know, looking, you know, around for female companionship. Kudos to Kevin Williamson for writing that because in the initial pilot, I believe all these characters were from, you know, Kevin's personal life, you know, right up to, you know, the Joey, the, the friend who lived down the, the creek and who would visit on a boat. So I don't know who I modeled after in Kevin's life, but I just thought the writing was extraordinary. I fully agree. I think, um, you know, even growing up at that time, it was, you know, my family went through a divorce um, where it was a different story. I mean, it was, it was my dad who had cheated, but, you know, it was still a very powerful thing during that time when all that was happening to kind of see that on TV and right, kind of be able right. to separate from the world and kind of be in that world. I, I don't know it was, it was a very powerful time. So it was definitely a good storyline to kind of have there because it was real. I mean, it definitely related to people. So. Right. And there was, you know, the resolution of it was all about forgiveness. You know, when, when there is true love, you have to have forgiveness. And I really had to redeem myself and work through my own stuff, as did John. But then in the end, it's like we realized that we loved each other, that we were soulmates. There's that word, soulmates. <laughs> and that love conquers all. So cue the music. <laughs> love conquers all. <laughs> you know, talk about like all the people that you, you got the chance to work with. This was another fan question. It works right into a question I want to ask too. Was there an actor or, or an actress on the show that you wish you would have been able to have more, you know, like either more of a storyline with, more scenes with, just more dialogue? Oh gosh. Um, no, you know what? I, I think I got to work with just about everyone. Um, you know, Nina and I didn't really get to work. She played Joey's old, sister but you know the matriarch of that family so Nina and I really didn't have you know too many scenes together um Mary Beth Peel who played Grams I mean the few scenes that I did have with her she's a scene stealer she's she's <laughs> amazing um I wish we could have investigated you know a little bit more of our relationship you know especially after Mitchell died she and I would joke, you know, on set that, you know, maybe we would get together at four o'clock in the afternoons and have a, a cup of sherry or something like that and I'll reminisce about the old times. But um, all of my scenes with John Wesley were, you know, fun to shoot. James, of course, is amazing. And he, he's, you know, a stickler for details. And Josh Jackson, he's off on a tangent. Who knows what you're going to you know, get out of Josh, but he's fun. 
Katie's adorable. Michelle was, you know, very shy and quiet, but she and I had a very good relationship. So no, I'm, I'm happy with uh, having worked with all of them. Kerr was fun. The guest stars were fun. Bob was fun. Okay, I'm just kidding. Back to you, Bob. <laughs> Nina had said that you know, that was the one thing she wished is that you know there was more of that storyline with with her and your character, especially it's kind of like the mom figures with each other. So, oh, that's nice. Wow. All right. So the million dollar question. Uh oh. And you would ask me, and we did record it, so I'll add that into this. But even though you have a probably a bias to this, Team Casey or Team Dawson when it was all said and done. You know what? Day. Everybody uh -huh. asked. Of course, I love my child. I yeah. would have been awesome. And really believe that Joey ended up with the right guy. So I'm Team Pacey in regards to you know, who should have gotten the girl at the end. Because you know you can always be a soulmate, a kindred spirit to your best friend, but you're not always going to marry that person. You can definitely tell how much you love being on Dawson's Creek with showing all of the back, um, all the all the behind the scenes stuff. Um, where do you feel it kind of fits with your whole profile, with your whole career? Kind of, where does Dawson sit in, in that picture? Ah, I understand. Well, um, you know, I've been working since 1980, probably, you know, before you were even born, which is pretty <laughs> Just kidding. You know, I, I, I did, you know, a lot of other work, and I've done a lot of other work. But the thing that probably will stick out in my memory as, you know, favorite acting gig ever would be Dawson's Creek because it was so unique at the time. We were shooting in Wilmington, North Carolina, so we were sequestered out of Hollywood. These kids had no idea what, you know, was in store for them. The writing was incredible. We all got along for the most part, you know, for the six years. And it really set a benchmark, I think, for, you know, future teen dramas you know, between the, the storylines and the music and, you know, the editing and all the publicity. So although I've done other work that I am proud of, Dawson's Creek really was a major, you know, part of my <laughs> midlife. <laughs> Is that what I want to say? Um, and I'll forever be grateful for it. And so that's why when people talk about a revival, a reunion, I thought, you know what, I have all this behind the scenes stuff because I didn't work, you know, five days a week, like, you know, the main characters. I had a lot of time on my hands and I always enjoyed video editing. That was something, if I hadn't been an actress, I wanted to be an editor, I thought. So I would just shoot all this video um, trying to get images, not only of the kids, the cast, but also the crew, because every year at the rap party, we would show this like 20 minute music video of, you know, what happened behind the scenes. So I just, you know, I hung on to it. And then, you know, when there was all this talk about, oh, a 20 year, you know, reunion possibly coming up, I thought, you know, let me just plant some seeds. Let's see if people still really like it. And I remember one of the very first ones I put up, it was like James was throwing a football with his brother on the beach and we were playing in the water and Josh was doing backflips. And it was like, let me just put it on there. And I think on my feed, it was viewed like, 225,000 times. I'm like, what? I don't have that many followers? What? And then with James over onto his feed, and it got like 825,000. So there was like a million people that watched one minute of the stuff that I shot. So I thought, you know what? People like this. And it, I think, especially in today's world, it's so crazy that people crave simpler times where, you know, you don't have that phone stuck in your face where you're on the beach playing, you know, football or, you know, just having conversations, you know, looking at each other's eyes and having conversations and connecting versus, you know, sitting with this thing in front of you and texting <laughs> back. So I think people are craving, you know, simplicity again. So I just give them little doses, you know, every couple of weeks. And, you know, hopefully they, they enjoy it. I get lots of compliments on it. So that makes me happy to share it. One of the things I read online was you had kind of touched on was that um, in that first season you had you had kind of filmed just a lot of the behind the scenes stuff and then kind of put together like that package kind of on your own to give to all the crew and then it became right. kind of a, a normal thing every kind of year that you know something you did and I want to actually I think it was and actually we have a fan question from him let me grab him real quick it, it, it was Craig Edwards that had mentioned it 
um, on one of the Facebook groups. And he has a question. He says, do you have uh, any fond memories of your favorite first team PA? Oh, that would be Craig Edwards. <laughs> He's so sweet. Yeah, Craig was like our wrangler. Um, if we were due on set and we were missing in action, if we were hiding in a trailer or whatever, that would be Craig's job to come and find out where is everybody you're due on set. He's he's just the jolliest spirit. He's he used to play jokes. If you didn't want someone to know something, you would not tell Craig. Not that he talks behind your back, but I remember there was like an episode, there was a pilot that I did a hundred years ago where I had to wear little Daisy Dukes. And I'm like, oh God, I hope nobody ever sees that. Do you know, he went and he found the pilot. And one day when we were in the makeup trailer, and I think Katie was there and James, I'm not sure who else was there. All of a sudden on the TV monitor right above our, our tables, there's, I, Craig went, bought it, because you had to buy DVDs back then stuck it in there and just embarrassed the heck out of me. So that's Craig Edwards. But uh, I, I still talk to him occasionally. He's a real good guy. I, I had joked with, um, or kind of joked with Nina that um, I should reach out to Craig and see if he'd be willing to be on the podcast and then she's, she's, you know, she's like, that'd be a good thing. I don't know if everybody would like the stories he would be able to tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I probably told you my most embarrassing one already, <laughs> but I don't you would have to okay that with the kids. I, I can't <laughs> um this came from um from TJ Basham. Uh he says so many questions you could think of, but you know, um as an amazing mother, you know, um always wondered if she cried like she did watching when you if, when you rewatched the episode with Mitch's dad. Oh um, how that you know, how does that kind of hit you, I guess, or how does that go? I could cry right now. <laughs> Um, again, John Wesley and I were connected at the hip. We, I mean, we're still in contact. We text all the time. When he comes to LA, he stays here with me. When I go to New York, I stay, you know, there with him. It, there's just this bond between the two of us that it, it wasn't Mitch and um, Gail. It was Mary Margaret and John connecting on a much deeper level. So, yeah. I watched back Cape Side Revisited, um, where he dies. And then I watched back um, The Long Goodbye. Sure, I saw because it just it brings it all back out of the gut and, you know, to the surface. Um, and again, I attribute, you know, my acting ability in those moments, you know, because of John Wesley and you know, with James Vanderbeek uh, after John died. It was, it was true emotion. It was, you can't fake stuff like that. How was, I mean, for six years, it doesn't seem like a long time, but really in that main time frame of when, especially the main four were really kind of growing up. Um, how was it to kind of work with James, work with Katie, you know, work with all of them, but, but really kind of just see them go from probably this, I have to imagine kind of awkward teenager to becoming kind of more of the adult that they became by the end of this, you know, by the end of the show, I guess, kind of seeing that whole transform and kind of being in that mom role probably more naturally too. Yeah. It, it was great. I mean, again, they, because we were in Wilmington, North Carolina, we didn't have Hollywood. We didn't have the hype. You know, the kids went to, you know, present at the Emmy Awards, you know, it's like, oh my God, can you believe what we're doing? And it's like, you guys are going to be huge stars. And they were just so unaffected the first, uh, you know, two, three years because it was just a job for them. Um, and I, I guess I played the role of den mother, you know, because I don't have my own kids. I'm just the mother to, you know, four-legged variety of, of children, you know, having dogs and cats and things like that. So I think I was just a very good friend for them, not maybe a mother figure, but more of an older sister, been there, done that, you know, you, you got to find your own way here. I can give you a little bit of guidance, but uh, they were pretty good at finding their own way. And, you know, Joshua, he had worked since he was like me, something when he did Mighty Ducks. On yeah, he had had a good a long time before that. Yeah, so he knew what he was doing. James had done, you know, uh, some theater works. Katie, on the other hand, who knew? Who knew? She's just so organic. 
and so authentic. And she's just, um, she had a lot to carry on her shoulders and a lot of dialogue, you know, with Kevin Williamson's, you know, amazing words that don't always flow trippingly off your tongue because there were, you know, some, you know, big words there. Uh, they just fell into it. And, you know, Michelle, there was a maturity level there. You know, Michelle was the youngest, but I swear to you, she has, you know, she's like an old soul. It just came so naturally to her. So um, I didn't have to give them any advice about acting at all. I mean, they were just seasoned professionals, you know, from, from the get go, it's at least as, you know, showing up, knowing your lines and, and being, you know, a professional, but uh, they brought so much to it. And again, Kevin's words, just, uh, it, it just really set the benchmark for, you know, years. Everybody was going to be comparing every other teen drama in the future to that of Dr. Creek. Jana Lee says uh, um, her quote was, or her, her full comment and question was, I think it was more comment wise, you've been one of her biggest inspirations, especially now with all your positivity and the way that you still support and reach out to others, um, especially James, because um, you could tell how much it meant to him, you showing up at, um, at the Dancing with the Stars. Uh, but now, how was that to kind of be able to see them um, to go there? Because like, I hadn't realized I don't watch Dance with the Stars. I didn't even realize he was on it until I saw actually on your feed that you and you and John had both been out. You, you guys went out there and were there for that. How how was that kind of seeing seeing the show or just kind of being? Well, the thing about Dancing with the Stars is I had been to the to the show several times over the last ten years because my best friend is one of the pros that started out on the show, Louis Van Amstel. Um, so I used to go and support him. So going to the show was always fun and glitzy and, you know, it's live. So you never know what happens. And then I remember I was on location. I was shooting a TV movie for Hallmark. I was up in Toronto, I believe. And a little news thing came up that James Vanderbeek is going to be on Dancing with the Stars. I'm like, oh, my God, my kid is going to be a dancer. So I called him immediately and I said, I'm so proud of you. You have nothing to worry about. Everybody's going to support you. Um, I was just, I was so thrilled. So I watched, you know, we communicated while he was rehearsing. And then he called me and he said, you know, Mary Margaret, I want you to come to the, um, to the premiere with my wife, Kimberly, and the kids. And I'm like, of course. Are you kidding? Of course, I wouldn't miss it. So that was, just, it was electrifying for me to sit there. I was like a real proud mama, even though I'm not his mom. I'm, you know, we're still very good friends. But then John Wesley uh, was shooting, uh, let me see, he was shooting a Hallmark movie up in Vancouver and he called me and he says, hey mama, I think I wanna come down and go to Dancing with the Stars, let's, let's call James. So I, I called James and I said, you know what? Got a surprise, the two of us are gonna come. And uh, it was Disney night and they were doing um, Pasa Doble. And so John and I got to sit there and we were just beaming. It's like, I think 20 years ago, where we all started and now to watch him not only, you know, be amazing, but just the commitment from him. And I was so saddened when, you know, there were circumstances, you know, his, his wife, you know, had um, a miscarriage, which was unfortunate as heck. Um, and he couldn't really continue on, you know, full capacity, even though he did dance one, um, and when he got eliminated, I I cried like a baby because I was actually going to be at that show that night with my friend Louis, and I decided not to go. Something just told me, mm, just doesn't feel right. But uh, I I could not be more proud of him. He's he's extraordinary. His dancing was extraordinary. He and Emma shined. Um, they should have won. But you know what? What are you going to do? You can't win them all, I guess. He's still dancing. I just saw him. Oh, and uh, he's continuing on with his dancing. He loved it. When they talk about the reunions, um, and I don't know if there's something that you that you want to talk about or even kind of mention, um, one of the, um, a fan had posted, you know, that they, um, to tell you that they love you um, and that they're disappointed that you and John weren't part of the reunion magazine episode. Right. Um, um, and that she wrote the company telling them that she was not happy that you guys weren't a part of it. I think it was the Entertainment Weekly was that right, last year. Right, yeah. You know, do you guys think that there will be a, a reunion or is that something, if it can be talked about, is that something that you think would be a, 
would it be a live action or not a live action, but would it be like an actual episode or would it be more of like a sit down, get together kind of? Kind of well, show? you know, we've all talked about it. Um, yeah, the Entertainment Weekly reunion, that was, um, that was kind of a shock that it happened, but you know, we've all talked about it since I've let it go. I personally, I, I took it as a hit because I felt like I was the one of everyone in the cast who kept talking about, let's do a reunion. Let's write it. Let's do it. The fans will love it. It will be a hit. Put it on Netflix. It was always me making these comments and I was doing the promotions on Instagram. And then, you know, I, I got a phone call and they said, um, oh, would you do a little interview? It's for this big story, Entertainment Weekly. And I'm like, well, sure. So I gave a phone interview and he says, but you got to keep it quiet. I'm like, okay. Uh, and then a week later, out of the blue, my phone was ringing and lighting up. And I'm like, wow, what's happening? What's happening? And then I saw what had happened in New York. And John called me and we were just like stunned. We were apoplectic. It's like, well, I guess, you know, we weren't part of it. But basically, it, it gets down to... They had a fly-in cast members. It was very expensive, and they decided on their own. I mean, Mary Beth Peel playing Grams. Of course, she should be there. She lives in New York. Michelle lived in New York. They would have to fly, you know, me in. John lives like two blocks from where they were shooting. So, oh, but you know what? We're over it. We're over it. What it did do was bring us all back together because Katie called the next day because they were blindsided. They all thought we were going to be there. Katie called me. James called me. Kerr called me. Kevin called me. Julie Fleck, you know, texted me. And everybody felt badly about it, but I've let it go. Um, everything happens for a reason. But as far as a true revival, reunion, um, we've all talked about it. Some of us have been writing things to contribute to it. I can't give too much away. I know that, um, I think you spoke with Kerr. Kerr and Dylan have talked about, you know, where their characters would be and, I've talked about where my character could be, and you know, that's about all I can say about it. It's not really up to me. I don't own the show. It would be, you know, Sony. It would be James if James wants to do it, if Katie wants to do it, if Joshua wants to do it. I don't know. We'll see. I'm hopeful. Let's put it that way. I'm hopeful for something. Um, they've contacted me about coming to Wilmington to do like a convention type. I, I guess One Tree Hill has done that in the past. I don't know if that's something the kids would want to do. For me, typically, I would like it to be a networks, uh, I mean, a Netflix, you know, limited series, like eight episodes. Let's just tie up all the loose ends. Where is everybody? Where would you be if you were still living those, you know, those lives? That's what I would like. So fingers crossed. We'll see. I think that would be a really cool way. And I think the, the, one of the cool things here is that even with that, I guess drama might be the best way to put it with how that kind of went. That it, it truly brought you guys back together and got everyone kind of reconnected, right. which, you know, probably was much more needed at that yeah, point. Yeah, so, everything for a um, reason, Josh. That's the way I look at it. And I wasn't going to say anything about it, but then darn it, my feelings were just so hurt. So that's why I, I just had to, you know, spill out my guts on Instagram. It's like, you know, I'm happy for all of you that did get together and I love you. I just wish I could have had the opportunity to say I love you to your face and to hug you and say how great it is to be back together again. But again, you know, there's, there's other chances. We'll see. But I do have one more question for you. Um, it was from Jay, uh, let's see, Jay Stephan Pierce um, on Instagram said, you know, have you watched the show since it re-aired? Um, and if so, what do you think of the music changes um, and the call from fans to release the show in its original form? Ah. Um, I, I have to be honest, I haven't watched it even during this pandemic. I've done a lot of binge watching, but I, I haven't gone back to Dawson's Creek, which doesn't mean I'm not going to at some point, because I'd like to revisit it, um, catch up on it. Um, wait, wait, okay, let's go back. What was his particular question about it? Um, what, um, with the music changes that they've done to it, where like they kind of changed the main song, how do you feel about the, about the music changes and the call from fans right. to kind of put the show back to us? Because I haven't been watching it, um, but I do read comments, you know, often about the music. I think it's a shame that they changed the music because the music was so much a part of the storylines at the time. It, it set the tone. It was a century. I mean, 
how often do you hear a song and it takes you right back to a place in time? So I think it is a shame that they changed the music. However, I think it was a financial decision um, because of copyright, but I, you can't quote me, I'm not sure, but I do see that the fans are disappointed and they, they love the, you know, the original music. And, you know, that's one of the things I try to do with my little Instagram um, music videos. I always use Adam Field, who, you know, was one of the composers on the show. I put his background music which just sets the tone. So um, if the show were to come back, I would hope that Paula Cole, you know, would be involved. Um, and we'll see, we'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that they changed it, but hopefully, you know, it doesn't ruin the show for the people. I definitely think like, I mean, obviously nobody expected streaming, even DVDs weren't really the thing that they were by, I mean, by the time you guys got to like the finale, they released, the, I remember them releasing the finale out on DVD like, two days after right. it aired um, and with the bunch of guys and that one they kept the original music but I, I from like what i read it had all of it's the contracting and the license right that initial one, yeah this was for tv and nobody really i think had that thought of like this is going to live forever and no one you know streaming wasn't a thing and nobody knew kind of how that would take right. off so right. you know. but hopefully that is something because it is that the original song is something that when you hear it, like if you watch the show, like I can hear it in a store and be like, yeah, yeah. It just, it back it to that, you know, to that back time. to, and it, it, it awakens all of your sensories and, you know, music sound is something, you know, that really tickles on your heartstrings and, and makes you laugh or makes you cry or makes you fall in love. So yeah, it, it was its own character on the show, the music was. All right. So, I get to interview John. Is there any special um, questions I can throw at him that would that would kind of be a good one, or do you have a special question you'd like me to ask as a fan <laughs> question? <laughs> oh, it just makes me laugh. There, there's so many things that we could go after John with. Um, hmm, we've reminisced about a lot of different things that happened, you know, to us behind the scene. Ask him if he remembers the day he and I were sitting in the trailer. We were just having a heart-to-heart -heart talk about something in, in, I think, my dressing room. And I said, honey, what time is it? And he looked down at his watch on his left hand. And I'm like, no, your other hand. And he looked down to his wrist on his right hand, and he had two watches on. So he had his real watch on and his prop watch on. And he says, Mary Mark. I've been wearing two watches all day long on camera and nobody caught it. I mean, it's just silly little things like that. Um, what else? You could ask him about dancing, the two of us dancing together, because it seemed like Paul Steuben or, or Kevin, someone always liked to put the two of us together dancing in our scenes. And at the time, you know, we were both kind of klutzy with it. But um, First, where can people follow you on social media and be able to Oh, well, you know, I don't tweet because, you know, that's pretty much, you know, all politics and I, you know, avoid that at all costs if I can. Um, on Facebook, I, I had to go private for, you know, a particular reason. But my account is the real underscore Mary Margaret Humes on Instagram. And that's where I put the videos and, you know, behind the scenes and flashbacks from Dawson's Creek or anything that's current, you know, about my Hallmark movies that I'm shooting or, you know my dog or right now with this pandemic i've taken up crafting so i've been doing macrame and making succulent reefs and oh boy just doing everything i can to you know stay creative i actually had to turn down i, I got offered um but it shot up in ottawa and i just felt like i wasn't ready to get on an airplane right now you know i have a husband i have a dog they need me i just I felt it was more important to, you know, stay home and have family time, just like you right now with your little one. One last question. If there's any kind of passing, um, final words you want to pass on to any Dawson's Creek fans out there or just any Mary Margaret fans out there? Um, oh, God. Let me see. Words of wisdom. I always, as, as far as love and relationships, if there's something that mom could impart to, you know, younger people today, it would be don't marry someone that you can live with marry someone you can't live without and it's very important to have communication skills you know between partners never go to bed angry and that's that's something that i always reminisced about when i was married you know quote unquote to john wesley 
Um, and then when he, you know, passed on, and then five years later, they, they had me marry someone else. I was just like, no, this just doesn't feel right. You know, there was just one for my character after, you know, she had the affair. There was just one. And um, so it's like, marry your best friend, marry your best friend, you know, try to get along. Life is short, buy the pony. I don't know. I guess, I guess that's it. I guess that's it from Mama Leary today. Well, I think that's a great way to kind of, you know, to kind of end it. Thank you so much um, Gosh, my pleasure. for being a part of this, for being a part of this show. And I'm hoping we get to, you know, we get to, you know, hear more from you and be able to kind of do more and, you know, but thank you so much for being a part of the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure. You have a great day. Have fun with your kids um, and stay tuned, you know, more to come. You just never know. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Show with Hollywood JDT and Stuntman Kirk. Want to stay in the know on all things sports, wrestling, movies, and TV? Follow the show on social media at The Show Podcast. If you liked today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And we'll catch you next time on The Show.